to present the Word of God. The uh, Lord led me to the Gospel. It's a parallel passage here. We have Matthew 17, Mark chapter 9, and Luke chapter 9. And uh, what we have here, the main theme is moving a mountain. What I mean is, or what the Lord means, is the Lord can do the impossible. The Lord can do that which appears that cannot be done. So uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer before I begin today. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we could gather here today, and we thank you for the privilege of being able to study the Word of God and look into it, and then preach it. Well, Father, open up our hearts and minds and help me as I try to present this. May it be in a clear manner. And may it be in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And we'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Overcoming great obstacles. Jesus and his disciples, Peter, James, and John, were coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. They were just on a mountaintop experience. Uh, they saw Jesus, the glorious appearance of Christ as he would be in heaven, shining in all his brightness, and, he pray, and as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glittering. So what a privilege they had, but here they are walking down now from the mountain, and uh, <laughs> they're coming back to reality again, okay? They were up. And up for a short time to see the Lord in glory. And now they come back to the real world. And that's where you and I live every day, don't we? In the real world. And this is what we have to face. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is coming down from the mountain. And he's about to do something which seemed impossible. First of all, we have the divine access the divine access. Multitudes of people in that day in Israel were about to have access to Jesus. They were about to see the Lord of glory. Would you have liked to live in that day and been in that place? To have been there when Jesus actually walked in Israel? And a great multitude of people, when he came down from the mountain, we're about to meet him. The divine access, being in the presence of God, who was manifest in the flesh, being in the presence of the Son of God. And so they, they came to the, the multitude. He saw a great multitude, in fact. And his most recent ministry that he had participated in with his disciples, uh, he had just fed multitudes. Just shortly before that, uh, commonly called the feeding of the 4,000 men beside women and children. And in that account, there was only seven loaves of bread and a few fishes, the scripture says. And then he had sent the multitude away and he came to the coast of Megala where the Pharisees and the scribes tempted, tempted him asking for a sign from heaven or a miracle. And he told them of the sign of Jonah. So interesting. Jesus then left that area by ship and headed northeast. But over and over, people had divine access to our Lord Jesus Christ. And he taught wherever he had. He came to a, a certain blind man and he was, he was healed. Came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. And over and over again, there was opportunity for people to see the Lord Jesus Christ. And the scribes questioned him, and they were greatly amazed. They run, ran to him. They were awestruck. They were astonished at, at what, they, what they saw. They ran to him in faith. And uh, we have our Lord showing himself and being there amidst people. Now, we have divine access to God, not in the same way. But we have divine access to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. 
Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So we who have trusted in Christ, we have divine access to the heavenly throne room. What a privilege we have to bring whatever it is that is burdening our hearts, we can bring it to him. But now, number two here, we have the deliberate association. We wonder, as the multitude ran to Jesus, if there were some that probably hoped for another free meal. There were those who, who wanted that. And the scribes, uh, they, of course, wanted to make fools out of Jesus as much as they could by questioning him. They were not really looking for truth, even though they were asking questions. But in that group, in that group, turn, the, the gospel writer turns our attention to a certain man in that crowd. This man sought to have a deliberate association with Christ. Through, among, among all those multitude of people, this man wanted to associate with Christ. So interesting. And Matthew tells us something that Mark and Luke did not tell us. And this man approached Jesus. Here's what the Bible says. He came worshiping him. There came a certain man to him, kneeling down to him. This man was serious. He wanted to get an association with Jesus. And so he comes to him in worship. He comes to him kneeling down to him. In the midst of that crowd, talk about a public confession of faith. In the midst of that multitude, here's this man who comes and kneels down to Jesus. He was very serious about this. This man, kneeling down to Jesus, got Jesus' attention. You know, if we worship the Lord from our hearts, if it's genuine, I'm going to tell you something, you'll get Jesus' attention. If it's not genuine, no, he knows. He knows the accurate, he knows what's genuine, he knows what is true. And he got, this man got our Lord's attention. He was genuine. He poured out his heart to God in the midst of all those people. Genuine prayer on the knees from the hearts gets God's attention. So I don't know what it is you're facing in your life, but if you want to get God's attention, it's got to be genuine worship from your heart. That's what will get God's attention. That's what he's looking for. And this man cried out to Jesus, and he told him what was happening with his son. He was making intercession for his son in the midst of all those people. Now, I'm sure in the midst of all those people, there was a lot of problems with a lot of people that were associated to that multitude. But here we have one who says, I really got to get a hold of the Lord. I really have to get his attention. I am so concerned, I have to come to him. I have to find out what's going on. And so he makes intercession. And here's what the Bible says in Matthew 17, verses 14 to 16. And saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. Have mercy on my son. For he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to your disciples. And so he presents the problem to Jesus relating to his son. Mark said, and one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And where, where, when, whosoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that if he could cast, should cast him out. This man pled with the Lord. Genuine, heartfelt pleading. I believe that's what God wants from us, don't you? Genuine, heartfelt pleading. How often do you find yourself 
in a heartfelt pleading to God to save that unsaved relative you might have. You just get on your knees and you with a heartfelt prayer, Lord God, deal with whoever it is. We need to pray for one another. We need to pray for those that are lost. We need to pray for those where there's division, where there's uh, not peace, where there's not calmness. We need to come to the Lord with a genuine heart and cry out to God and pour out our, our hearts to him. Luke says, Behold, the man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is my only son. And lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out, and it teareth him that he foameth again, and bruising them hardly, or let him slowly suffer it out, to depart from him, and I besought thy disciples to cast him out. Again, we have Matthew's perspective, Mark's perspective, and Luke's perspective perspective and here this man is crying out with all of his heart to God now what is going on here with with this boy with this son of this man a demon a fallen angel or an unclean spirit whatever terms you want to use controlled this boy it controls him he was demon possessed demon influenced whatever words you want to want to give here isn't it interesting that the father knew what the problem was? He said, a spirit overtakes him. He knew what the problem was. And uh, he, was, he knew it was an evil spirit. His father used the word lunatic. Lunatic. In Matthew 14, 15. By the way, that word means moonstruck. Moonstruck. Very interesting word. A demon possession. The sad, in, in our world today, there are a lot of problems with a lot of people. And not all unsaved people are demon possessed. But there are some who are. But in our world, we don't want to be honest as this father was as to what the real problems with some people are. No. We don't want to recognize what really is going on with some people. We don't want to recognize sometimes demon possession or demon influence. This father did. In Mark, we're told that he said his father, had, his, his son had a dumb spirit. This boy did not speak. Could not speak. And it seems that every once in a while, this boy would have what I would call a major epileptic convulsion. That's what it seems was happening here. And because of, the boys, because of this, the boy's life was in danger. And because the evil, this evil spirit would try to bring harm to this boy. To either have him fall into water to drown or to be burned by fire. To kill him. Make no mistake about it, demons are in our present world, and they are out to hurt people. That's what they're all about. They're out to hurt people in one way or another. And the evil spirit would throw this boy's body down to the ground, he would foam at the mouth, he would grind his teeth, he would be bruised because of the throw down to the ground, his body was getting torn up, this evil spirit would very slowly let up on him. It was kind of like a torture thing. And it would seem that this father, and it's interesting in, this, in these accounts of these passages, there's no mention of the mother, and others, he would enlist to, to help his boy also, beside for him. Someone had to be with him around the clock just in case one of these things would happen. There had to be someone there to try to assist him from not harming himself. This father had a real burden in his heart, on his heart, in his life. 
Picture yourself as the father of this boy. What would you do? It would be what we would call a genuine nightmare. Right? Genuine nightmare. The father's heartbroken. We can hear the problems of others, but when it hits us, whew, then it's a different story. Different story. Different thing. And then there's understanding, and this father pled with the Lord. He pled with God. The demon sought to hurt this boy. The fault lay with the demon. It was e these, this evil spirit that brought this suffering upon this son. Someone might ask, why would God allow this? We really don't have an answer. We are told generally because of sin and the curse that we're going to face problems generally all the time because of sin. Sin has not helped the human race. But why this son had specifically this problem at this time, I don't know. We don't know. I do know this. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his acts. I know that. There are some things we can't explain. But God is always righteous and God is always holy. Therefore, we can trust him. We should not turn against, against God because as a result of some type of suffering. Many people are faced with a lot of difficult burdens. Not all burdens are the results of demons, by the way. Not all of them. Some as we are as with this boy because the scripture tells us what the problem was. But some are not. Some of the burdens and trials of life and sufferings of life are because of our submission to our sinful natures. Some of the things we get involved with and some of the consequences we have to faith, face is because of our wrong choices that we make. James says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. God knows whether someone's involved in a, a demon situation or if it's submission to the lusts of our own sinful natures. Sins of all sorts are committed because of our submission to our sinful natures. The author of the book of Hebrews said, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. There are sometimes, sometimes, where trials that we call burdens can actually turn into be blessings. Sometimes. I think back to a, a girl I met, a young girl I met years ago. She had a rare lung disease. And her parents were determined not to bring her unto uh, the care of others, but as much as they possibly could, they wanted to take care of their own daughter. And even though there was all kinds of people telling them, you need to institutionalize this girl, they decided not to. And I, when I was pastor at that, uh, at that church where this, I knew this family, I watched them for nine years. She, she died the year that I left there. But I watched for nine years the tender, gentle, loving care of that girl around the clock. They had to suction her all the time or she would have died. The parents chose to do that. And that burden, that burden, which was, it was a big burden. The father worked a full-time job. The mother had a part-time job. They had to, you know, live financially. 
but they, between both of them, they would financially around, I mean, they would take care of their daughter around the clock. It turned for that, those parents, that burden turned to be a blessing in their life. What a testimony they were for our Lord Jesus Christ. What a testimony. The secret thing, now why did this happen? I don't know. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. I don't know. Now, let's look at the disappointing acknowledgement. We're in Matthew 17, 16, or Mark chapter 9, verse 18. And all three of the gospel writers point this out. It's so interesting. And I brought him to thy disciples, he says, this father, and they could not cure him, the son. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. Luke chapter 9, verse 40. The disappointing acknowledgement. There are two key things here. As I said, the father recognized what the real problem was with this boy. It was a demon, an evil spirit. A deaf and dumb spirit needed to be cast out of this boy. His father said to Jesus, I came to your disciples, but they could not help my son. They failed me. In my desperation, I came to them for help, but they couldn't help me. There have been many times where it has been said by very many people, I came to the church of God, I came to a local church, I came to the church of God looking for help, but I got none. You ever hear it? Didn't get it. Miraculously, up to this point, this boy's life had been spared. And I'm sure the Jewish uh, Pharisees and so forth were thrilled that the disciples couldn't help him. You see, the world loves to point out the failures of the church, doesn't it? You ever hear them? You ever hear the failures? <laughs> and the truth is, if we're honest, we do have failures. We do have failures. We don't always have it together. I wish I could say I've always had it together. Have you always had it together? We have to recognize it. The unsaved world loves to hear of the church's shortcomings, of its disagreements, of its scandals, and whatever else happens. They rub their hands in glee. But here it is. It's not over yet. God can improve our lives, can he? If there's been failure in the past, can't God give us the grace to improve something? I believe he can. We can grow in, in the Lord. We can have victory over sin. We can be more useful in our lives for him. We can progress upward. We may not have it all together, but we can progress. That's the, that's the uh, what shall we say, the encouragement for our life. We can progress. And if we get to the point and say, ah, I just don't feel like going on anymore, don't give up. Don't give up. Keep progressing. Keep moving up. We pray for people who are sick. And you know what? Sometimes they remain sick. You ever notice that? We pray for them. Are we failing? I don't believe so. God said to bring the needs to him. And we leave it to his will. What can happen? We pray for people to be reunited. Sometimes. 
there's sometimes uh, division between people over all kinds of circumstances. We pray that people get together. We pray and sometimes they remain divided. You ever notice it? I wish they would get together. Does that mean we failed? We brought it to God. Our Lord knows what's going on. Our Lord is not asleep. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. He's wide awake. <laughs> the Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. Jesus knows our struggles and failures. He knows. And he keeps kind of nudging us. Frank, come on. Get up. <laughs> Ever do it with you? <laughs> He's right there to encourage us. Look at, this is worth a look. If uh, you have your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. This is a tremendous uh, passage. Uh, verses 12 and 13, but especially verse 13. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, did you hear what that says? In other words, we have a time of faithlessness. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. He's going to stick with you. It's so amazing. We might give up on people. Do you think you'd give up on people? You might say, I'm tired working with that one. <laughs> There's no hope with, with him or her. But the Lord keeps, keeps encouraging us. His Holy Spirit keeps working in our hearts. He is faithful. He cannot deny himself. The Holy Spirit is there to convict us. When we acknowledge our faithfulness, our, our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Lord will lead us to higher ground. The disciples had failed to meet this son's needs. Our failure should lead us to a greater dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The work of God is done by his power. We need God's intervention. We cannot do it ourselves. Jesus said, without me, you, ye can do nothing. We need him. The principle hasn't changed, I don't believe. And so this unclean spirit had no mercy, came into this, only man's, this man's only son, took control, we don't understand it, but it happened. But there are some things we can know and seek to follow. The Bible tells us that parents, for example, are to teach their children the word of God. That's from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and many other passages. The devil and his demons are, are mercenary and unfeeling, and they still work on young minds. And so we seek to fill the minds of young people with the word of God. So they hopefully personally will on their own put their faith and trust in the Lord. The devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is using every means possible to seek to turn away people from God and from the word of God. Number four, we have the direct admonition. So what we learned from number three, by the way, don't be discouraged. Yes, we failed. Come to the Lord, say, Lord, help me to improve. Keep plodding on, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The direct admonition, number four. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you or allow you? That's also in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verse 19. The direct admonition. How long will I let you go on?
I'm sure they wish Jesus would have told them something else. <laughs> Don't you? Maybe they would have wanted Jesus to kind of gather them all around and pat them on the shoulder and say, hey, you're doing all right, folks. Everything's fine. It didn't happen. He told them what the problem was. He told them the truth. No beating around the, the, the bushes. He said, you people are the problem. The twofold problem. It says they were faithless. They were faithless. They were not trusting. They were in a state of unbelief. Number two, they were perverse. In other words, they had turned away from the truth of God's word. It's what we call today apostasy, departure. Oh, faithless and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? The direct admonition. A question that should be asked and probably is not asked relating to a lot of things today is this one from the book of Romans that says, what saith the scripture? Wouldn't, you, wouldn't that be wonderful if we heard that question? What does the scripture say we should do about this or that? We don't hear that. Number five, the devoted attention. This account could have ended right there but it did not. Jesus could have walked away from this father. But he cared for this son. And he said this, bring him here to me. Bring him to me. And the Bible says, Mark and Luke, they brought him unto him. Help is coming for this for this father and this son. When things seem beyond hope, we need to look for the Lord in, to the Lord in faith. They were helpless. But the Lord said, bring him to me. He cared what was going on. Our Lord, many times in the scripture, he cries out for us to come to him in faith. Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart. But to show, uh, number six here, to show you how vicious and mean that Satan is, we have the dastardly attack take place. At the very point while this man's son is right in front of Jesus, this evil spirit assaults him. Right in the front of Jesus. He has an epileptic convulsion right there. He foamed at the mouth. He was in complete misery. It must have been a very traumatic thing to watch this. As I said, where's the mother? I don't know. No mention of her. And when he saw Jesus, the moment Jesus saw this young man, the evil spirit immediately began the attack. Straightway the spirit, the evil spirit, tear him, bodily attacked him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming, foaming at the mouth. And so this son was greatly suffering at that time. The Bible says, and as he was yet a coming, the demon threw him down and tear him. The word tear means to rend, to mangle, to rip at, to hurt. There's probably, I looked up to get an idea about an epileptic convulsion, and here's what it says. There's temporary cessation of breathing, a lap of consciousness, lapse of consciousness, incontinence, jerks and spasms, tongues, tongue biting. So it's a vicious attack. It's a vicious attack. And in my opinion, not all epileptic convulsions are caused by evil spirits, but sometimes they may be. God knows is the case here with this son. And we have the, this attack right in front of Jesus. But then we have the distressing abridgment, and abridgment is a shortened or condensed account. And that is what the father did here when Jesus asked him a question. 
and he asked his father, how long has it been since it came to him? And he said of a child, since he was a child. And oft times it cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. This boy didn't have a life. He could be drowned, he could be burned up. Someone had to be watching him all the time. And then we had the desperate appeal of the father. Mark chapter 9, verse 22. What a wonderful prayer. I think it's a prayer we should use. His father cried out, Mark chapter 9, verse 22, and pled with Jesus, but if thou canst do anything, have compassion with us and help us. We're desperate. We don't know what to do. We're on the ropes. Can you think of a time in your life, maybe, maybe you haven't had such a time, but can you think of a time in your life where you were just completely desperate? You're, on, you're at the end of the, of the line. You're give up. You're, you're done. You're finished. You don't know what to do. Well, that's, that's this. Hope seems gone. That's this situation. But in the desperation, he called upon the Lord, this father. Desperately pleading with God to help in time of need. David knew what this is all about by a lot of the Psalms. I tell people all the time in their burdens of their life, use the Psalms. David cried out to God in his desperation. And then we have the decisive answer, verse 23. You get, Jesus gives a cl clear answer to this father. He did not leave him in the, in the dark. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. There's the tremendous truth. If you trust in me, all things are possible through me. Trusting in Jesus can, can produce miraculous results. That's what he's saying. He didn't leave him hanging in the air. He said, you trust in me, something good can happen. You know what? Jesus Christ is alive and well today, isn't he? We can come to him, whatever the burdens are of our hearts. The same Savior that helped this father and this son can help you and me. And we have then, verse 10, the dual or the twofold approach here. This is such a tremendous and honest prayer. Look at Mark chapter 9, verse 44. This is just worth a look, and it's, it's worth memory if you, if you want to memorize this thing. And straightway or immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears. Notice he said with tears. This man's heart is broken. What a prayer. Not a long prayer. Lord, I believe, <laughs> help thou my unbelief. This man was really moved. Cried out with tears. Lord, I believe. I, I find myself in very uh, agreement with this, with this prayer, how I sometimes feel. Lord, I believe. But... Help my unbelief. Yeah. Talk about an open and honest prayer. This man didn't sugarcoat anything. He told it as it was. He said, Lord, I do believe, but I'm having some doubts here. Lord, help my unbelief. That's such a reality. We believe, but there's a lack of faith. Do you find yourself in agreement with this guy? He prayed what was actually in his heart, by the way. God honors this prayer. Dual approach. Lord, I do believe. But Lord, help my unbelief. Help me in the areas where I'm lacking. 
God does not pound us in the, into the ground when we acknowledge unbelief, does he? He says, I'm sick of you, and pounds us into the ground. No. He accepts our honesty with him. That's what he does. Accepts our honesty. Well, I'm going to let you, since you have the outline there, on your own, read ahead and see what happened. But God answered their, their prayer. God answered their prayer. And if we come to God with this kind of a faith, and with the burdens of our hearts, even though there are situations which seems to be impossible, God can work. Do you believe that? He may not work the way we think, But God can work. May this passage, I hope, be a challenge to all of our hearts. Let's pray. Father, we confess. Lord, we do believe. But Lord, help our unbelief. Lord, may we come to you, and pour out our hearts to you, Whatever it is that's going on in our lives, recognizing what you can do, that you will work. Bless this congregation, bless its pastor and family, and we just ask your best for all of us. In Christ's name, amen.